It's April the 15th, 2021, and welcome to the Water Action Platform. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, the days are getting longer, the sun a little brighter, and at the back of every water resource manager's mind is the issue of whether or not there'll be a drought in the coming months. So this week, partly due to the coming summer and partly in acknowledgement of the festival of Ramadan, which has started earlier this month, we have a particular focus on water efficiency. So today, alongside the usual COVID-19 updates, we're going to hear from two utilities, one Spanish and one English, about what water efficiency things they're doing. We also have an and finally section that has a story that just cracks me up. It relates to the Bristol stool chart. And if you've not heard of it before, you're in for a treat. However, I must start by thanking our wonderful sponsors as listed here. The Water Action Platform is now moving into its second year. This is our 26th broadcast, and many of our original sponsors have kindly agreed to continue their support. Without them, the Water Action Platform would not be available to all and proudly free at the point of use. Thank you, sponsors. We love you. But before we get into this week's water efficiency theme, let's start with a couple of COVID-19 slash water related stories. And we have a short vaccine update from the always brilliant Dr. Joe Burgess. But our first story today relates to the moratorium on water shutoffs. Now, we initially reported on this story about a year ago, just as the pandemic was kicking off. Water utilities around the world started holding back their plans to cut off people who weren't paying, wary of making worse, making a difficult situation worse um, as the rising pandemic took hold. Now, the key headline here is that research by Cornell University and the Food and Water Watch found that states in the USA which suspended disconnections had significantly reduced growth rates in COVID-19. This is an amazing finding. Before the pandemic, protections from water shutoffs were pretty rare in the United States. But on March the 9th, 2020, Detroit became one of the first US cities to pause water shutoffs and temporarily reconnect water services to all residents. This action sparked a wave of moratoria nationally, with more than 800 localities and states following Detroit's lead. Now, on this map, you can see how the coverage spread, with dark blue indicating where the moratoria was actioned and red indicating where it wasn't. This graph highlights the relationship between the water shutoffs and the COVID infections. The Cornell researchers ran a regression model and concluded that water shutoff moratoria decreased the daily infection growth rate by 0.235% and the death growth rate by 0.135%. Now, that might seem tiny, but a very small change in the growth rates can have a significant impact. The researchers modeled shows that the impact of similar moratoria nation nationwide could have saved 480,000 people from COVID-19 infections and almost 10,000 lives. That is not a figure to be sniffed at. Our second story is an update on wastewater-based epidemiology. As we've discussed previously here, WBE currently provides a great regional picture of coronavirus levels, but it doesn't easily tell us whether the variants are on the rise. The researchers here from Ben Gurion University in Israel, and they've found a way to tweak one of the PCR tests that are currently used to assess SARS-CoV-2 RNA levels in sewage so that they can screen for emerging variants. They first developed their tweak for the British variant, and then they went on to the South African variant, and it's likely that it can be adapted for other variants as they emerge. This breakthrough could be a game changer in alerting authorities firstly to the spread of the variants and then enabling them to take timely action. This brings us rather neatly to our now regular slot with Dr. Joe Burgess on vaccines and their variants. Joe is in South Africa and has kindly agreed to give us the following three minutes three minute, this is what you need to know update. Joe, over to you. Thanks, Piers. It's good to be back. Um, here's a quick update on our vaccines table. As always, the peach colour indicates new information and there is a lot of new information. So first up, Pfizer. On the 1st of April, Pfizer gave us a glimpse of their six month in clinical trial data and it looks absolutely beautiful. 12,000 people now have six months of data. 
efficacy is 91%. They had 927 COVID cases, 850 in the placebo group and only 77 in the vaccine group. They found no impact on efficacy against the South African variant, which is great. Um, however, this is a very small sample size, so we can't be completely confident, but it's a good sign. Their vaccine presented 100% of severe disease on both the old variant and the South Africa variant. And they also found 100% efficacy in the adolescent trial, which is also really good news. So it still works against lots of variants, and it's been approved for warmer storage, meaning we don't need to keep it at minus 70 degrees. And that means much easier distribution and much better global access. For Moderna, phase one for a vaccine booster against the South Africa variant has just started, and they've shown that their vaccine still works against lots of variants, as you can see on the table. So on to AstraZeneca. Efficacy remains high um, against the UK variant, 75%, and that's the only variant that they've assessed so far. Novavax have released data from their UK and their South Africa trials. It hasn't yet been peer-reviewed, but what they've shown is that it's great against the old variants, 96% um, efficacy, against the UK variant, 86 and against South African variant, 49%. But in all trials, most importantly, there were zero hospitalizations and zero deaths in the vaccine group. And these data haven't yet been peer reviewed. Talking about variants, we're starting to learn a lot about P1 or P2, the Brazilian variants of concern. They look as though they're acting a lot like B1351, which is the South African variant, and that makes sense because a lot of the mutations are exactly the same. We have some data from the one dose J&J &J trial and we know from Turk et al. that the mRNA vaccines will work against P1. Now onto transmission and adolescent trials and trials for pregnant people. There are now seven sub-studies and they're confirming a range of data from 50 to 95% reduced transmission. And this is a huge range and that's typical for such drastically different scientific studies. The variability is probably due to things like sample size variation, location, different vaccines, genetics cultures, and it will be a long time until we know the true percentage for each vaccine. With the variants of concern, we won't reach herd immunity until we get the kiddos vaccinated, and thankfully there have been some updates just this week. So for Pfizer, the paediatric trial has enrolled 144 children between 6 months and 11 years of age, and they're testing three different doses to work out which is best. Once they've done that, they'll trial their vaccine in 4,500 children. The results are expected around September, October, and if all goes well, distribution in early 2022. The results from the adolescent trial, which is um, 12 to 15 years of age children, they should be coming in the next few weeks, and we should be on track for vaccinations to children of that age by the end of 2021. And Moderna's the same. They started theirs on 16th of March. They will enrol 6,750 children um, six months to 11 years of age. Then the other two, J&J &J plans to start their paediatric trial soon, um, and AstraZeneca started their paediatric trial in March in the UK only. And we are heading back to the UK. Piers, back to you. Thank you, Joe. We now come to the first of our two utility experts, Jaime Barber, the chief executive for IDRICA, which is part of the water utility Global Omnium. But before I go over to Jaime and Valencia, I thought it would be good to share the following water efficiency statistics. The data presented here is from a survey undertaken by the Asian Development Bank at the end of last year. It involved 20 water supply service providers from 11 countries across Asia Pacific. Special thanks goes to Jeff Wilson from the ADB, who gave us permission to share this sneak peek from a report which will be produced later in the year. This first graph confirms what we saw last summer namely that most water utilities saw domestic water use rise whilst commercial use dropped. Drilling deeper into the data and looking specifically at non-revenue water, the respondents in this study noted significant increases in billing inaccuracies, unbilled consumption and pipe bursts during the pandemic. Over 30% of the utilities saw an increase in non-revenue water. How did these utilities respond? Well, here you can see a summary of the various measures that they were implemented in their distribution systems. 26% applied changes to their pressure management systems and over 20% adapted more digital solutions. That embracing of digital solutions provides me with a fantastic link over to Jaime in Valencia. Jaime, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Piers. How are you? Good to connect with you. 
For those people who don't um, uh, know much about uh, you and Idrika and Global Omnium, I know you're going to talk about this in your presentation. So I'm going to let you take over the slides and talk us through your mini lecture on water efficiency. Yeah, we will. We are growing now, this claim. Thank you. We are Idrika. We, I'm Jaime Barba, the CEO of Idrika. Uh, we, we are uh, giving solutions and services all, all over the world uh, of, of the cycle of water. Our main product uh, is the software is GoAiwa. Uh, we have 11 headquarters all over the world, uh, 250 employees, and we come from the digital transformation of Global Omnium, a utility that manages 400 uh, concessions in, in Spain. Um, okay, we understand that the main pillars of the water revolution that we are living are based on the know-how in, in four uh, specialises in water cycle, in technology, in data cybersecurity and data science. Uh, just about the water, we have people that have been uh, 20 years working, uh, in, in more than 20 years working in, in a, a utility of water. They know every the processes of of, uh, of a utility of the cycle of water. Just about the technology, we have made the digital transformation of Aguas de Valencia Global Omnium. Uh, the last 10 years we have de developed a platform that is breaking the silos of information of, of a water company, is modular, is flexible, uh, we, are, we have really know how in that sense. Cyber security, we are so making the surveillance 24 7 every day of the year of different concessions. And the data science, we have skills in data science that are really the, the point that has a break the, the, the possibilities in, in, uh, around the, the world of, of changing the, the different utilities and how contributing to the main pain points of the utilities that mainly are the water efficiency, the energy efficiency, the resiliency, and of course, uh, the contributing to the circular economy and to focus on the, on the citizen. That is something that the water is, is mandatory to do. Uh, okay, how we do that with different cases of use? We have cases as use as the digital twin, where we have scenarios that help us to operate uh, perfectly uh, uh, to look for the, the non-revenue water and to improve the, the management of a drinking water network. We have, for example, energy efficiency uh, cases of use where the data science is deciding where, where, when to fill a tank and which is the level that they, they have to have in this tank uh, just to provide the service uh, to a city using the forecast demand of that city, using the prices of the energy to be efficient. Also, we have uh, cases of use to be efficient in the, uh, in the operational management of a sewer network. Uh, making uh, preventive detections uh, in SSOs, CSOs, leakages uh, and blockages and using uh, maintenance plans for that. And finally, for example, uh, cases of use where we, uh, we, we contribute to the circular economy because we are making the surveillance of urban sources, industrial sources in, in the sewer networks and alerting the, the waste water treatment plants of what's going to happen for have the best decisions to come back the water uh, to the environment. So thank you very much for that. There is a lot of uh, cases of use, but there's no time for more. Now, I appreciate that was covering a huge amount of information in a very short time. So thank you for that. Um, if I could uh, maybe take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. So you mentioned citizens a few times there. Um, can you talk me through how you engage with the local citizens? Um, yeah, uh, we, for example, uh, are uh, using patterns of consumption uh, because we have been for, for more than 10 years uh, working with smart metering. And, uh, for example, we are alerting of leakages inside their households or alerting uh, uh, to the people that live alone uh, about uh, maybe they're not consumption in all the day. Uh, to, to control that they, they are healthy in, in their houses. Or, for example, uh, we are uh, working in, in gardens uh, for, for making the efficiency of, of the irrigation of the garden, using uh, information of the, of the humidity of the ground and information of the water, cross-referencing all the information and deciding automatically how to irrigate the garden and how to reuse the water. Brilliant. Well, um, and... 
I, I know it's a bit of a sneak peek for the uh, something that's coming up in a couple of months' time, but you're, you've kindly agreed to host a digital twin, a digital tour uh, on June the 9th. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, we are going to present to uh, all the people, we are excited about that, uh, how we operate with this digital twin that I'm telling. And, and it's going to be presented not for the digital uh, people, uh, but for the operators. They are going to explain how to operate with that. This is in June. This is uh, two sessions in, uh, in different time, uh, schedules. And we are really excited about that and being, being together, Pierce. I think it's going to be spectacular. We had 200 people, more than 200 people, attend the AGEA Digital Twin Tour uh, in December. So we want more people now coming, coming to your one. Um, Jaime, thank you very much for taking the time out to join us today. Uh, I wish you the very best. Uh, thank you to you and the, to this initiative. Thank you. So in a moment, we will hear from the other water utility, Thames Water. But before we get to that, Here's this week's technology showcase, and this one is a blinder. It's from a company called Creative EC, and as a bit of a giveaway for what's coming, the EC stands for Everything Connected. They've developed a product called Waterfall. It's a smart meter that's used to collect water event and billing grade consumption data from domestic and commercial customers. It's an ultrasonic water meter combined with pressure and temperature sensors, and it's installed inside a customer's property. It transmits high-frequency water consumption data to the cloud for AI and machine learning analysis. The rich data set that's generated provides an incredibly detailed insight into the nature of water consumption, thereby allowing water companies to encourage their customers to be more water efficient. In the following short video, which is taken from a longer presentation, Greg Coughlin explains what it means to monitor water events in a property and the water efficiency benefits that can be observed. Well, essentially within that edge device that sits in the property, we've got um, sensors measuring pressure, um, flow, so a billing grade uh, ultrasonic water meter, and water temperature in two, two elements of the device. Um, and that combination of measurements in real time and highly, highly frequent allows us to actually profile events going on in the property. This, this graph here on the left-hand side shows you um, a typical event. This, this happens to be a toilet um, uh, system refilling. Um, and the first, the left-hand side of this graph um, is the flow and the pressure for the first three seconds of the event. In other words, as that valve is opening and flow is starting to build, you can see the highly frequent sampling allows us to profile that flow. It also profiles the pressure. Um, with a bit of a dip to start with as the valve first opens and then it smooths to a lower pressure as the event occurs. The right hand side is what, what we then do is capture the remainder of the event. Um, so you can see a relatively constant flow but just to give an example of how sensitive our measuring is, this additional event in the middle is actually someone turning the tap on to wash their hands whilst the toilet is filling and you can see the, the effect that has on pressure as well as flow. And then to the right hand side, you can see the drop off of the event. And you can also see a little pressure spike as the valve shuts on the toilet. And this really is a, a hugely uh, important and impressive uh, set of results we found from a trial with SES water. So essentially what we did um, about a year ago is install uh, 15 units into customers of theirs uh, across their region. And the challenge was to understand, does Waterfall's engaging mobile app uh, and its insight and, and unique ability to tell people what they're using water on with water event ma uh, management, does that drive different behavior? And essentially, the, the blue line is consumption. In the UK, that's measured as per capita consumption. Um, and at SES is this, this group of people who are already metered, I might add. So there's already people have already made reductions through metering. These, this, is, this is beyond what's achieved through metering. Um, what we see is um, when, when we start to use Waterfall's nudge and insight and to target people with messages, their consumption goes down, the blue line, and the engagement with Waterfall goes up. So what we're saying is that it's Waterfall isn't just about collating this data, it's actually turning it into real um, targeted insight uh, and nudge messages. And what we found through the early part of this year when we did the first set of tests 
as I say, is PCC came down from just over 130 litres per day per person to just over 100 litres a day per person. Waterfall was developed in partnership with Water Utilities. It was specifically designed to help reduce water consumption on a large scale, rather than just for those who are particularly water conscientious. It can also contribute to network performance monitoring at a DMA level. Having successfully completed some UK trials, the company will be moving into other regions with water scarcity issues. As always, if you want to know more, just let me know. We now come to our second water efficiency sector expert, and this time we're staying here in the UK. I am delighted to introduce you to Andrew Tucker, the Water Efficiency Manager for Thames Water. Andrew, are you there? Hi, Pierce, I certainly am. Marvellous. So for those people who don't know anything about Thames Water, and who couldn't know anything about Thames Water, can you just give us the 20 second who Thames Water is and what you do in Thames? Sure. So we're the largest uh, water provider. We're the largest company by population in the UK, uh, supplying a, the biggest chunks of London. My role is head of water efficiency and demand reduction strategy, and is quite possibly the most perverse role in the entire sector or any across the industry, is that I have a 100% monopoly so everyone in this piece of geography are my customers uh, 100 percent of our customers use our product every single day but my role is to get 100 percent of our customer base to use less of our product <laughs> i love it you must wake up every morning with that burning through your brain well um andrew i know you've prepared a sort of mini lecture for us so i'm going to hand straight over to you and uh, let you take it from here okay thanks very much so quite simply, so our area covers uh, much of London and the chunk of the Thames Valley. So out to the west of, uh, of London, we cover about 10 million people for clean water and we uh, provide wastewater services for about 15 million people. So uh, uh, overlapping with other water companies. Uh, it's a huge area, but our biggest challenge is population growth and development. Uh, quite simply, we don't have enough product for the future demand. We need new water resources to come in and we need to bring demand down to bridge that gap of uh, going into the century. Okay, so we have we are currently rolling out a smart meter program and smart is advanced meter infrastructure ami so we've got a fixed network across london and we hope to bring that across thames valley in the future and we're getting hourly reads of data let me just play this for you now hopefully and what it is is a uh, we're rolling out um, smart meters in all households we're putting them into non-households businesses as well whereas before we'd have manual meter reads we might get a million a million and a half meter reads a year with the 500,000 that we've got in the ground right now, we're getting over 11 million meter reads a day. So you go from traditional water company to almost overnight to be having to deal with like, we're a big data company. But our key thing now is using data, turning that into insight and putting it into action to drive demand reduction down. Things that we're finding, 11% of all London homes never stop flowing. It's a mixture of wastage inside the house and leakage on customer supply pipes. Things like leaky loos inside the house contribute about 5%, at least 5% of all homes have a leaky loo. The other thing we're finding out is game-changing insight. We now know more accurately where water is actually going, or even more importantly, where it's not going. We know that people use more water than we thought because predominantly, previously, a lot of that unknown water went onto leakage. So the more meters we get into the ground, the more data we get, the more insight we get, the better we can be, the more cost-effective we can be to manage that precious resource. Um, going forward, we want to increase this. So we've got about 690,000 smart meters in our plan for the next five years and we're talking with government and our regulators to make that a bit higher and hopefully act as a, a catalyst to drive rec economic recovery uh, off the back of COVID impacts as well as deliver more green credentials. Extra stuff we're finding, we've gone through COVID, we're coming out of COVID, but COVID's had a massive impact on water consumption. Business water consumption has come down, 
household water consumption has gone up and we're using smart meter information to see how that pans out. What does it really mean? We know what it is right now, but what's it mean in one year, five year, 10 years time? Are we going to be working differently in five or 10 years time? So we're now seeing that there's a big delta between where COVID is and where what we call an average year. And what we're also finding out is this wonderful metric that we've you see everywhere called per capita consumption. Whereas typically you'd see, oh, the average person in the UK uses 141 or 146 litres per person per day. Smart meter information now shows us they absolutely do not use that. So it's a skewed average. So we're seeing now that a smaller number of households that use a lot or lose a lot through wastage inside the house actually skew that average. It means, and the last bit I can show you, is that we the smart meter data has completely shifted the way that we do water efficiency now and going forward. So instead of just offering it and doing broadsword and going battalion across an area, we can now have almost like a special forces unit, use the data, target high usage, target wastage, and you get better bang for buck, and hopefully we'll bring that average number down over time faster. So Pierce, there's a snapshot of what we're doing on smart meters and what it's doing for us to drive demand down. So. Uh, that point around the PCC, I mean, water utilities have spent decades being obsessed about controlling the PCC. And, and um, that's incredible, that, that insight into how skewed that is. Um, so where, where next? What do we do? What do you see coming next as we come out of the pandemic with relation to water efficiency? So we've got, we all work in five-year economic plan periods. So we've got really big programs on smart metering big programs on water efficiency, but the biggest changes for the country and for our area for London and the Thames Valley will actually be reliant on policy change, regulation change, new things in there. So actually the biggest demand reduction opportunities don't sit with water companies. So we're looking forward to a national target that'll come from a, from, from government through a new environment bill in the future. That'll, that'll probably put water efficiency on all industry, regardless of where they are, on the same agenda or the same platform as their energy efficiency or CO2 reduction. Those, those water and energy need to be driven together. And labeling, we wanna see the introduction of mandatory water labeling. It's the only thing that's gonna improve the performance of every single water using device and appliance in every house and every business going forward. It's a no brainer and we can't wait to see it. Manda um, every washing manda machine, every fridge, every, every freezer, water labeled. A lot. Nice. Well, um, Andrew, I could spend hours talking with you. I, as you know, I used to work at Thames Water and I miss it, miss it greatly. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for the invite. This week's and finally uh, story is perhaps not for the faint hearted or those with delicate sensitivities. Then again, if you have delicate sensitivities, you probably don't work in the water sector. The following story appeared in The Guardian earlier this month. It relates to a new startup company called The Gut Stuff, who, according to their website, empower gut health. They encourage people to examine their faecal stools and measure them against the Bristol stool chart, as illustrated here. Now, the Bristol stool chart is a clinical assessment tool that was designed in 1997 to classify human waste and help with the diagnosis of things like irritable bowel syndrome. Let's be clear, stool gazing, for want of a better name, does have some beneficial purpose. A natural aversion to your feces is healthy. And for good health, we should all be producing the types three and four on this chart, rather fetchingly described as a sausage with cracks or a smooth snake. Um, but this is where it gets interesting. In this increasingly digital world, there is now an app called the Moxie Poop Scanner, which claims it can categorize your fecal stools using AI. However, when this app was reviewed by Wired last year, the author found that it was unable to differentiate between her face and her feces. On that bombshell, we come to the end of this week's webinar. Thanks again to our sponsors and contributors this week. I hope you enjoyed today's water efficiency focus. Forgive me, but I felt I had to include that dirty and finally story simply to balance things out. The next webinar will be on Thursday the 20th of May at the usual times. Megan will circulate calendar invites shortly. 
Our theme next time will be on hydrogen generation from wastewater. And I look forward to seeing you then. Keep asking questions, keep sharing, and keep safe.